Hello everyone, welcome back to the PMFIS Current Affairs Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is going to be your test number 9. Uh, which we are going to discuss in this particular video. This is your first part. So we would be discussing the first 20 questions uh, in this particular video. There would be five such videos as you know the format. So I really hope that you uh, guys uh, uh, had a good time solving these questions and I'm very sure you're going to learn a lot of things while understanding this particular discussion by the end of this video you would be thoroughly clear about these questions and i really hope that you have uh, so far checked out and started practicing our test series if you still have not started it's a high time the link is in description below where you can practice 1000 high quality mcqs at just rupees 499 so what was the first question so first question of our test number nine is very interesting question with respect to the art and culture the question is purely based on the current affairs because it was in the news for some very important reason and the statement was with respect to the Khuni Bhandara also called the Kundi Bhandara. Now obviously this is an art and culture question so obviously it is going to be heavily based on the factual knowledge that you should be having. So what is this Khuni Bhandara and from where we have picked up the question first understand the the context why we have we have picked up this particular question recently six heritage sites from madhya pradesh they have been included in the tentative unesco list we have not we are not saying that we have added them in the unesco uh, heritage list they are tentative list for any site to be included in unesco heritage list at least for one year it is always first put in a tentative kind of list and then they do their process and then only it is going to be included in the final UNESCO list. So out of these six heritages, we have these particular and all of them belongs to the state of Madhya Pradesh also. So you may have a question as a match the find of, uh, following kind of question. So do remember all six because they are very recently in news and that includes number one, the Khuni Bhandara, which is which is in the historic city of Burhanpur belonging to Madhya Pradesh. So that is why this news is very important and here are the other uh, uh, you know six heritage sites as well where that includes the rock sites of Chambal Valley, we have the Bhojeshwar Mahadev temple of Bhojpur, the Gond monuments of Ramnagar Mandla, historic ensembles of uh, Dhamnar, we also have a question, we also have a question on this as well that is coming I think question 4 or 5 and then we have Gwalior Fort Madhya Pradesh, so all of them. Are, are they have been added in the tentative list the keyword is tentative list and this particular Khuni Bhandara that we are talking about yes it belongs to the uh, Burhanpur the historic city why historic because you must have seen in your even in your NCRTs there are so many ancient sites that belong to this particular uh, region in Madhya Pradesh we have so so many archaeological sites historical sites a uh, uh, lot of re historical remains we have recovered from Burhanpur and it is one of the most important ancient site. But what exactly is this so called Khuni Bhandara? Now look at the picture. Khuni Bhandara means this is, an, this is a kind of underground water management system. The underground water management system that you can see here. And these water systems they were constructed way back in 1615 CE during the governorship of Abdur Rahim Khan Khanan who was actually uh, who was under the Mughal Emperor Jahangir's reign from where now you can see as the name suggests it's an underground water management system so what they used to do so as to transport the water underground and it, it was a technique why it was done because in this way if you are going to transport the water there, there are no chances of any pollu pollution of the water you are also going to save the water from the leakages. So that is why this underground water management redistribution system was developed. But this was not the original techniques of Indians. Actually, this whole thing of Khuni Bhandara, it was actually influenced by the Persian approach. The Persians used to build these kind of things. And this is a classic example of the blend of the Persian and Indian, uh, you know, art and culture that you can see and it was built by Mughal emperors it has its historic connection with the Mughals that you need to know since we're talking about this Persian system in Persia we don't used to call them Khuni Bandara in Persia and other Middle East countries such system used to be called as the Kanat system now the current system is same 
and why it is so important because that time obviously there was no power sources right so this whole movement of the water used to be relying on the gravity force alone and based on that gravity understanding the gravity and that's why the whole structure was built in such a way where you can actually carry the water even for the long distances by by uh, you know by crossing the water from these underground structures and that is the way it was developed in india you have such systems not just in burhanpur uh, you also have such kind of systems in other deccan cities including aurangabad bijapur and bidar so it's a very very important system of water uh, carries that you can see now what is the problem in the question if you can see the question the first two statements are absolutely okay i mean just a very basic thing it's underground water system mugalera yes sir burhanpur absolutely fine the problem is with third statement look it says this has been included in the final list no it is included in the tentative list not the final list it is yet to be included after a couple of maybe next year or after that right so in this case only two statements are correct very easy question because it's a very straight forward question and just by the basic understanding if you have read this topic without any problem you can know and obviously if you are preparing for the prelims you must be aware of all important unesco world heritage sites be it in the final list or the tentative list and you see i always recommend you to prepare this topic because in the in the last couple of months you must have seen lot of news coming uh, on the unesco world heritage sites and, and there are many many such sites which have been added either, either to the final list or to the tentative list so do prepare this topic very well very easy to attempt without any issue you could have solved this question guys that brings us to the second question second question was with respect to the map based knowledge of yours now here the question says which one of the following regions of the countries are associated with the gibraltar arc i'm sure you must have seen i'm very sure you must have seen something called as gibraltar strait if you if you know if you want to connect the atlantic you want to connect the mediterranean the best way is that you are passing through the gibraltar strait it's world famous and i'm sure we all have seen it on the map even if you have you do not know exactly the gibraltar arc because it has its connection with the tectonic movement of the plates at least you know the place called gibraltar you must have seen the gibraltar strait so definitely it is not associated with indian ocean not at all with pacific ocean right it has its connection with the atlantic connecting atlantic and mediterranean between atlantic and mediterranean you have this so simply by eliminating the other options i am only left with this option called as the alboran sea so for solving this question you just need to have a basic common sense by eliminating the other wrong options even if you do not know the answer you can still solve the answer as okay it has some connection with the alboran strait so because clearly gibraltar is not indian ocean not pacific ocean it has its connection connecting the atlantic and mediterranean so very easy question because of the elimination technique you could have attempted this statement very easily now let me give you some more knowledge about this so this is the map you should be looking at and here is the strait of gibraltar i'm talking about this is your mediterranean sea and outside you have this whole something called as the atlantic ocean right now if you are if you see the very first water body within the mediterranean you have the marginal water body called as the alborian sea so here is the alborian sea right guys and please look at gibraltar though it is in spain but its control is with 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 uh, in, in the hands of united kingdom so even today it is the united kingdom that actually controls the gibraltar strait and gibraltar city though it belongs on the map it belongs to the spain so be careful about that also so now why it is in the news recently a very interesting study was published where it was said that gibraltar arc is quietly creeping westward now the the tectonic plate under it was actually going westwards it might invade the atlantic leading to gradual closure of the ocean basin and that is why it was in news because if something like that has happened or is going to happen it's going to be a huge very very big tectonical development guys and of course when whenever a tectonic plate moves it it uh, strikes with uh, any other tectonic plate there are chances of the subduction because the heavier one because see the gibraltar arc is is more of a 
uh, oceanic plate so it is always going to subduct it is always going to go into the subduction zone the benioff zone that you must have uh, uh, read guys right so this is the important one now gibraltar arc is a geological region if you if ever you have to explain it if you ever have to define it it's a geological region that surrounds the so called elboran sea that you have seen on the map and it is located on the western side of mediterranean it's the first water body within the mediterranean sea that you can you can, you are going to see gibraltar arc is it is under right under the gibraltar strait that you can see on the map and it is between spain and morocco so this strait of gibraltar actually separates spain from morocco guys it's a it's a 10 mile gap gibraltar strait and it is very important point when it comes to connection of atlantic and mediterranean it's a very important one so definitely now you got the answer and yes because the plate is moving and it is it is expected in the next 20 million years we are going to see huge developments in this particular area along with other some plates are also moving for example the lesser antilles arc is also showing lot of movement even the scotia arc is also showing lot of movement so in these particular areas in the next 20 million years you are going to see lot of subduction zones happening whenever the subduction happens between the two tectonic plates one plate goes down it always gives rise to other tectonic activities for example your activity in terms of earthquakes activities in terms of volcanic eruptions and that is why that is why it is expected that this system is going to be very similar kind as we see the pacific ring of fire which is very um, in famous for 80% earthquakes and 80% volcanic eruption something similar might happen in this region it may become a new uh, new ring of fire that you can see right that brings us to the question number 3 this question number 3 is be very careful it says which statement is not correct the very first thing you always have to focus is this whether they are asking you the correct one or they are asking you the incorrect one the question is with respect to the baluch liberation army they have recently attacked the gwadar port this is our focus area keep information is gwadar port so the question is with respect to the gwadar port you have to give the answer i think it's a very simple question why gwadar port is already a very famous port of pakistan and you know the gwadar port is the end the termination the terminating point of the chinese chinese pakistan economic corridor that we talk about now the context you understand so already there is a rebel group in baluchistan province of pakistan and this separatist pro, uh, group of baluchistan is called baluch liberation army they are struggling they are they are uh, you know they are in a, a rebellion mode it's a rebellion group separatist group who want to uh, you know get independence of the baluchistan province and recently gwadar port has seen you see the pakistan map in front of you so here is the gwadar port that you can see and it is it is on the arabian sea okay so be very careful now gwadar port is that you can see here this is a warm water port point number 1 to be noted and this is located in baluchistan province the southern the last point of baluchistan province is the gwadar port it was actually developed by chinese why under the china pakistan economic corridor that started way back at uh, kash nagar and it it is it is it is passing through the pakistan occupied kashmir and it connects the chinese province of xinjiang to the to the gwadar port and it is always suspected why chinese are you know uh, increasing their presence on the gwadar port they call it as because of economic uh, activities but we always suspect the china may misuse this port for some kind of surveillance on india or maybe some military action on india and that is why to counter such possibilities india has developed just 80 km maritime distance 80 km away in iran we have developed the chabahar port which is on gulf of oman it's a counterbalance kind of strategy that we have now so clearly you have seen gwadar port is not on gulf of oman it is the chabahar port which is on gulf of oman gwadar port lies uh, simply uh, in the arabian sea all right this is important guys now and this is this is a part of very important uh, trading trade route as well so another point that you need to learn that gwadar port located in uh, in pakistan's border with iran that you already have seen and india is always very uh, you know india is always very not happy on the gwadar port development by china because ultimately china is you see this is your india right 
So this is our India and China is under its uh, string of pearls policy. China is trying to construct as many as you know uh, ports, uh, commercial ports, military ports basically to encircle India in Indian Ocean and decreasing our influence. And Gwadar port was also developed under such policy. It's a major part of the CPC that I'm already talking about. And it connects the city of Kashgar in China to the uh, to the Gwadar port that we are talking about, right? So it's and of course India India has a counter of string of pearls just to give you additional knowledge. So to counter the string of pearls policy of China, we have our Sagar initiative, the security and growth for all in the region. Anyways, the point is I hope you have understood so far. Now if you go back to the question, so clearly which statement is not correct, sir? The only problem with the statement is statement number two because it says. The Gwadar port is on Gulf of Oman, no sir, you, but you just have to know the Gwadar port is on Pakistan. This is the very basic information and you can straight away eliminate any possibility of Gulf of Oman. So how many are not correct? Only one is not correct. Otherwise the two statements we know why bordering with Iran is important statement because of the Chabahar port that I just discussed. Very easy question, straight away you could have answered this without any trouble guys. Now that brings us to the next question number four. Now this question again has a connection with question number one. It is about the historic ensembles of Dham Nar. Now this is also one of the six heritage sites which are included in UNESCO tentative list, not the actual list. So now you already know that this statement is absolutely wrong because we just have seen that it is it, this, uh, this uh, site from MP is also as a part of tentative list. So clearly all four are not going to be the answer. At least we know that, right? Okay, now let's talk about it. Let's learn about the uh, historic ensembles of Dhamnar. So the context already you are aware of. I, I'm not going to repeat this first context, guys. Now, important, very importantly, it's a tentative list part. This heritage site, this historic ensembles of Dhamnar, as you can see in the picture also, it's a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, caves that you can see. It is in the Mansur district of Madhya Pradesh, number one. And what exactly these uh, historic ensembles of Dhamnar, what exactly they are? They are a total of 51 caves of different sizes and you can see they, these different caves are carved into the laterite hills. And this is the beauty, it's a masterpiece that you can see and that's why we have proposed it in the tentative list of UNESCO. Now very importantly, this whole, uh, the whole structure that we're talking about the whole ensembles of Dhamnar, it consists of two groups of structures. The whole, all 51 caves have two group of structure. One belongs to the Buddhist caves and another belongs to the Hindu temple complex. So please understand the historic ensembles of Dhamnar, they are quite secular. It consists of two religious, uh, you know, caves. So Hindus and Buddhists. In Hindu complex, very famous uh, temple is there called the Dharm, Dharm Rajeshwar temple. So you may have a question coming on this as well as a separate one. This temple is also called as the Dharmnar temple. That is important and probably somewhere the name of uh, the Dhamnar somewhere has come from this particular kind of thing. Now please remember the construction whenever you're talking about history, the dates are quite important. No, so these Dhamnar Buddhist sites, the caves, they were cut somewhere between 5th to 7th century AD. Which, which was actually the time of second wave of cave constructions in India. And it was this period of time where you must have seen in history, lots and lots of cave architecture was developed. Even Dhamnar was a part of that wave. So it was constructed between 5th to 7th century AD. This is absolutely important. If you go back to the question, sir, the only problem or the only right answer, I would say the right statement is the first one that yes, the Dhamnar is, uh, uh, is it's, a, it's an ensemble of 51 rock cut monument. First statement is correct. Fourth, you know, is not correct. Even there is a problem with the date. So we just have learned between the 5th and 7th century. So this is also wrong. Now the hills consist of the three groups. No, sir, not three. We have seen the Jain caves are not there. Dhamnar is only Buddhist and Hindu temple complex. So very slight, slight details are needed to solve this question. This I'm not going to say this is, was an easy one, guys. It was a medium level question, probably tough for some people. So please be careful because if you have this kind of question where you have lots of facts involved 
and you have very less scope of guesswork. So be very, very careful about it. You can take a risk because it was in current uh, issues. And if you have read the current issues well, probably you can solve it or you can take a risk about it. But be very careful with such kind of questions because there are so many slight, slight, but very important details are included. So right answer, which statement is correct is going to be only one in this particular case. Okay. Now, moving on to the question number five. This question again is from the current issues. Now, the question is about the Afanasi Niketin C mount, which was in news for a very important reason. Why it is important, I'll talk about that. But where exactly this C mount is? What is a C mount? What is a C mount? You must have seen, you must have read in your oceanography that there are certain, uh, you know, mountain peaks which are underwater. They are called C mounts. They are C mounts if they are, they have conical uh, shape. If they are flat shape, they are called gout. You must have read the difference between a gout and a sea mount. But why this Afanasi Niketan sea mount, which is underwater mountain, it, it belongs to Indian Ocean, but why it is so much important and why we should be knowing about it, let's try, try to learn it. The context or the reason why this was in news was because India recently applied to the International Seabed Authority, which is an autonomous international organization which has which always gives the right of mining to the to the to the any country who applies for it so any you know anything with respect to the sea or sea resources marine resources you always have to take permission from the international seabed authority right and this authority was actually established under the un convention on the laws of the sea i am sure you must have read about it the UN laws of the sea are the are those laws which actually divides the rights of the countries when it comes to exploiting the water resources or using the water as a resource. You must have heard about territorial water, contiguous zones, exclusive economic zones, so everything or the high sea international water. So all that division is done by the UN CLOS and whenever you have to, whenever you want to mine or exploit any maritime resources, you have to take permission from the International Seabed Authority, which is under the UN CULS. Now, talking about this, uh, where India has applied uh, uh, to the IBSA, where we are actually applying to get the rights to explore the so-called Afanasi Niketan Seamount. And not just this, another, there are two important sites in the Indian Ocean Seabed that we are actually trying to mine. We are trying to explore for the resources, obviously. So, one such site is Afanasi Niketan Seamount. Another one is Carlsberg Ridge. So be careful. Now the test series has asked you about this, but you may have even this coming as an MCQ because both are equally important from the UPSC point of view. So these two, all uh, both of these locations are in the Indian Ocean. This is very important. For first, I'm talking about the Carlsberg Ridge as an additional information. It's a mid-oceanic ridges, which is which spans approximately three lakh square kilometer. It is located in south of Arabian Sea, northeast of the Somali Basin in Central Indian Ocean. I recommend you guys to please open up your map and on the map, the physical map of, uh, of uh, Indian Ocean, try to, you will easily see the Carlsberg Ridge. It's a very famous uh, mid-oceanic ridge that we have. And this is very, very important for polymetallic sulfides. It's very famous for these polymetallic sulfides, which we really want to explore. Okay. The polymetallic sulfides are nothing but large smoking mounds near the hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents are those locations on the seabed from where there is continuous uh, ejection of, you know, la uh, that uh, magma is coming out. And that continuous evacuation of the magma actually, uh, you know, deposits all these important uh, resources like copper, zinc, gold, silver on the seabeds that, that later we explore. So, that's the Carlsberg Ridge. Now, we are, we are exclusively talking about the Afanasi Niketan Sea Mount, right? So, look at, the, look at the location, guys. So, here we have India. This is Sri Lanka. And you can see this particular location in the, in the uh, Indian Ocean. Here we have the Afanasi Niketan Sea Mount. It's a very, very, very important uh, uh, sea mount that we are targeting to explore the resources. Why it is so important, guys? Because this sea mount is actually cobalt. It has cobalt rich crust right and it, it lies in central Indian basin 
it's almost 3000 km away from indian coast so this distance is approximately 3000 km locations are important now you may have this question coming as a place in news as well you never know right so this again is very very important for you talking about the afanasi niketan sea mount it is not just the cobalt it is also rich other than cobalt it is also rich in nickel manganese copper and it also has the potential for mineral extraction that's why we are seeking rights of its mining from the iba international seabed authority remember these small small patches they are not part of india's exclusive jurisdiction they are not part of india's exclusive economic zone if that would have been the case india would not be applying for uh, permission so clearly this sea mount is not part of india's exclusive economic zone be careful you may you may have this statement coming uh, this way to trick you that you know the, the this particular sea mount is part of india's exclusive economic zone that's not the case in fact there are other countries also who are already claiming rights on this region including sri lanka even china is undertaking reclamations of this particular region so there are so there there is a competition there are multiple countries trying to explore these resources and now india is new and has come into the race so become very important for you now if you look at the statement and you look at the question guys absolutely all statements are very simple very straightforward uh, question it was it this is a very easy map based question simple question without any twist or turn for you so all four a uh, four are correct and could have been attempted easily just with good knowledge of map and good knowledge of the current affairs that's why current affairs are very very important i always say guys that current affairs are the they are the real uh, mix they are the uh, they are the gravy that you need for the upsc exam so whatever subject you are you are uh, you are preparing doesn't matter current affairs always add value into that okay now please try to get the understanding of the exploration rights also so since we are talking about the exploration of one sea mount by india you must be aware that specific uh, the exploration rights are very specific to the areas that are part of the open ocean right open ocean where no countries can claim any sovereignty and for that purpose that is why you need to take up permission guys currently no country has commercially extracted resources from these open sea which are also called the high sea right so uh, and uh, exclusive economic zone i all told you uh, exclusive rights or exclusive economic zone is up to 200 nautical miles from the from the coastline of that particular country okay moving on to the question number 6 again i am taking you to the history guys here which statement is correct you have to talk about this question is with respect to the ramakrishna movement very important topic ramakrishna math ramakrishna mission swami vivekanand all these names must be coming into your head so let's talk about the ramakrishna movement and some associated facts so yes guys it is true when you think of ramakrishna movement as the name says it was a hindu spiritual movement first thing is first that you need to remember why the name is ramakrishna movement because this hindu spiritual movement was inspired by the teachings of shri ramakrishna who was a mystic saint from bengal number 1 number 2 ramakrishna mat and ramakrishna mission they are the twin organization actually that uh, that are that come from this ramakrishna movement okay and very very important guys this ramakrishna movement is it was a vedanta movement see there are six philosophies uh, that we have in indian philosophical uh, you know landscape and this whole ramakrishna movement was actually based on that vedanta movement or vedanta philosophy that i will explain later it's it's an important one so far remember it was a hindu spiritual movement and it has two basic twin organizations to carry forward the movement one is ramakrishna math another is ramakrishna mission of course this mission is very very popular because of swami vivekanand ji right so this ramakrishna mission that we're talking about it was a registered society that was actually engaged in the service of mankind founded by swami vivekanand so that is why ramakrishna mission is very very popular the headquarter of both the beat the ramakrishna math or mission the headquarter of both are situated in the belur mat on the bank of river ganga in west bengal this is absolutely important ramakrishna mat is actually an order for the sanyasis 
the mission i told you is a registered society for the service of mankind so the objectives are different but the ultimate aim is with the connection with respect to ramkrishna um, uh, this movement guys right now talking about the ramkrishna movement this whole organization actually and mainly propagates the hindu philosophy of vedanta like i already told you so this whole idea of ramkrishna movement was based on the vedanta philosophy and not just vedanta philosophy but also on four yogic ideas called the gyan the bhakti karma and raj yog you may have this statement coming as the mcq as well so be very very careful the original propounder of the advait vedanta the vedanta philosophy was actually the adi shankaracharya even this important fact you need to remember guys what exactly the philosophy of advait says the this particular philosophy vedanta or advait actually says the individual soul the atma is not different from parmatma the ultimate reality so ultimately maybe i am looking different the god is different but ultimately my soul my atma is not different from the brahman the ultimate reality and that is why the philosophy is called advait there are not no two identities we look different but we are ultimately one entity there is a connection between our soul and the ultimate reality okay this is absolutely important now if you look if you go back to the question everything seems perfect not just the last statement so clearly you have understood with me that you have understood the ram krishna movement is not not related to the uh, philosophy of mimamsa but philosophy of vedanta and do prepare the philosophies very very important topic guys all six philosophical schools schools you need to prepare if you know all the schools i really want you to comment in the comment section box let me see if you know all the philosophies or not so here first second and third are absolutely correct the only problem is statement number 4 now of obviously this particular question ram krishna mission the first few lines are very straight forward but i know this was not an easy question it was a medium level question i'm not going to call it as an easy one be careful again because it has many small small details involved i know this question was heavily based on fact not just the common uh, topic or something so be careful while you risking it and ultimately try to at least try to find out one or two such statements which you think are right or not not correct so something like that you have to begin with some some concrete knowledge you have to begin with if you are not at all comfortable if you have no idea about the whole movement and you have high level of confusion and if you know your knowledge about the question is less than 50% 40% 50% then you should skip because ultimately it is heavily relying on the facts so you really need to be careful about such questions plus it has many many statements so obviously uh, you cannot simply by guesswork you can't be correct with four statements you do some guesswork in two statement or three statement but four statement guessing them is really difficult task next question is again based on your map knowledge so i always say do prepare maps a lot and you see you must have seen the last couple of uh, uh, you know years upsc is actually focusing a lot a lot on the places right so talking about the haiti haiti is the next uh, question in news so the question is about the haiti's location of course you can't solve this question without the knowledge on the map but first of all why we are talking about this small island called haiti some context has to be there no so it was in news because india recently launched operation indravati to actually evacuates indians from the turmoil stricken haiti here on the map you can see so you may have this as individual question also which of the following uh, country for which of the following country india launched operation indravati you may have this question you may have question on operation indravati as well so be careful about this information this is the this is the recent information so you may have a stand alone mcq coming on that as well now please be careful on the map look at the look at this map here is the caribbean islands you can see cuba jamaica haiti uh, dominic republic now very careful where you have haiti haiti it is part of it is located in the caribbean sea not atlantic not pacific nothing like that sorry uh, sorry not pacific but caribbean which itself is a part of atlantic ocean number one statement okay because ultimately caribbeans are part of atlantic extensions of uh, atlantic only look at the location guys if you can see this one big island this complete island is called hispaniola now this hispaniola island 
actually consists of two countries. The western country is called Haiti, the eastern country is called Dominic Republic. So one island divided and shared by two countries. The name of the island is called Hispaniola, which is in Caribbean Sea of course. So clearly you can see the only country with which Haiti share its border is Dominic Republic, not Cuba, not Jamaica, not any other Virgin Island or something like that. Okay, now keep this into the mind. If you go back to the question, now you know the answer as well. So yes, the second statement is correct, sir. We have just seen the island of Hispaniola shared by Haiti and Dominic Republic true. Have you seen any border of Haiti with Cuba? Not at all. Only one border sharing with Dominic Republic. Is it, is it in Caribbean? Yes, sir. But is Caribbean part of Pacific? Not at all. Caribbean is a part of Atlantic Ocean. Very basic knowledge. Very basic knowledge. So very easy question. Straight away you could have solved it with only one as the right answer because two statements are incorrect here. Right? Okay. Question number eight. Now again, very interesting question. Having some, you should have some knowledge of maps, some knowledge of geography. That is important, guys. And some knowledge of current affairs as well. So the question was with respect to the Antarctic circumpolar current. What is a circumpolar current? Any ocean current which is which is completing the circle that is called circumpolar current. The word circumpolar is something that circulates in a in a circular manner that that moves in a circular manner and completes that particular round. So what we need to know about the Antarctic circumpolar current? Let's try to understand. Let's get onto the fact, guys. So first thing is first, whenever I talk about, whenever I use the word Antarctic Circumpolar Current, I am going to call it as ACC for, for, the ease of say, for the ease of seeing it. So ACC is also called as West Wind Drift, also called West Wind Drift and this is the largest wind driven current on the earth. You have no other ocean current which is as largely driven by winds, the west winds here as it is ACC. You can see. If you, look, if you look at from the South Pole, you can see Antarctica and very easily you can see in the clockwise direction, you can see the movement of this ocean current called ACC, Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And not just the largest wind driven current, in fact ACC is the only current that goes all way around our planet because normally you, you must have seen because of the land masses the ocean currents are normally broken. They are not continuous. You, they are only in limited area. There is no such ocean current that, that can claim that it is circulating the whole earth. Only current that goes all the way around our planet is this ACC because of course in this area you have no land mass and that is why from South Pole you have this whole dominance of water and only current and very interestingly, very interestingly since I am telling you that it goes all the way around our planet. So obviously ACC is somewhere connecting the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Ocean. No guys, oceans don't have real boundaries. No. So if any current is crossing the whole earth, it is actually going to connect the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Ocean. So, so many information just in two lines, there are, there are, there is so, so much information that you actually need to focus upon. My suggestion, since we are talking about the ACC, do not forget to see some important water bodies around Antarctica. You never know, you may have this question coming in the exam. For example, don't forget to see the Rose Sea on the west side of Antarctica, the Weddell Sea on the right side of Antarctica and also the Drake Passage which actually separates the Antarctica from the South America. So these two, three water bodies you must be focusing upon because you may have questions coming on these as well. Okay, now please remember, since we just have seen ACC is the only current which is global in truly global in nature, but what about the direction of its flow? I just have shown you it was a clockwise direction, not anti-clock. It was if you if you look at from the South Pole, you just have seen this is the way the whole uh, clockwise direction it is moving, and and remember why we are talking about it, ACC plays a very crucial role. This one current is very, very crucial when it comes to regulating the global climate. How it, how it regulates the global climate? Because of it, there is exchange of heat. 
there is exchange of carbon dioxide there is also exchange in the chemical between the oceans so that is how it regulates the global climate so you may have this question all as well coming that how acc regulate the global climate so now you know the answer by exchanging the heat carbon dioxide and chemicals between the oceans because it it, it ultimate connects the whole oceans that's why recently researchers have analyzed some samples from the from the acc and guess what what we are getting right now so the as per the researchers they are saying that since southern ocean winds are gaining strength and they have already gained strength by 40% in the last 40 years that means the southern ocean winds are speeding they are continuously gaining the the velocity is increasing and you just have learned with me that acc is actually a largest wind driven current so obviously if the winds velocity are going to increase by default the speed of the acc is also going to increase so actually the researchers are say, saying that acc's flow speed is dramatically increasing one because of the speed of southern ocean winds uh, has increased number two even because of human caused climate change that is also strengthening the acc because there is more carbon exchange now there is more heat exchange now you see because of more heat and more carbon dioxide exchange even the speed is um, uh, getting further ahead further it, it it is going to increase also one more thing you just have learned with me that because of the strengthening of the acc more heating is going to increase so also remember one fact the more acc is going to become stronger more velocity it is going to attain it is also going to contribute the melting of the antarctic shelf because of the more heat transport to the antarctica's ice shelf i hope you have got this got this concept straight in your head so everything is fine about the statement everything is okay only one problem the direction problem so you just have learned the acc is not anti clockwise it is a clockwise direction other facts are quite simple and yes like i told you for solving this question you need to have a knowledge of geography you need to have knowledge of your map and the current issues as well the latest recent discoveries are also important so this question was a tough one i would i would say it was a tough question because obviously it's not very easy predictable you you really do not have much of the guesswork here so be very careful while attempting this question attempt it only if you have 70% or more knowledge about it if you really do not have much knowledge because the options don't give you much of the elimination space also so here the right answer is only 3 but be careful while uh, even uh, with the skipping it or with risking it okay now that brings us to the question number 9 now this question number 9 is about the operation meghdoot so why this question is so important for us of course it has a very interesting history operation meghdoot is not something we have started now this operation was launched way back in 1984 absolutely correct and it it was a very famous operation conducted by indian army to take control of the siachen glacier this is a well known fact every upsc aspirant must be aware about the operation meghdoot and it is still underway the operation has not stopped though we have taken the whole control of siachen glacier and you know even today india is maintaining its the whole control of siachen glacier for for of course which is a very tedious job hats off to the indian soldiers the brave hearts of indian army who are actually holding their positions at such minus degree temperature imagine imagine you are spending your whole month and months and months in the siachen glacier and protecting it against any encroachment from the pakistan side okay so this and it is still underway the operation is still carried on by controlling and holding the position of siachen glacier so first statement is well very well known the only problem that you can see in this question is that this operation was conducted in kargil region of ladakh the name says her it is in the siachen glacier and siachen glacier does not belong to kargil it's a basic knowledge that everyone should be aware of we have seen the kargil war and you know the kargil region is way downwards and the siachen glacier is way upwards so siachen glacier belongs to ladakh and this whole operation meghdoot as the as the name only says the siachen glacier is not related to kargil region so this statement is not correct now very interestingly another map based knowledge small trick played by the by the question this operation 
yes it was aimed at capturing the saltoro ridge saltoro ridge is a very important ridge but it does not lie on the east of siachen glacier if this is my siachen glacier here you have the saltaro ridge so on the western side so very small 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 uh, you know uh, details minute details you need to have to solve this question so it was a medium level question sir only one statement is correct you can attempt it because it's a very famous uh, uh, the whole area is very famous the siachen glacier saltaro ridge everything is quite aware we are we are all aware of it so first we need to learn certain facts about it why what let's see so like i told you operation meghdoot is all about taking control of siachen glacier and you can see see here the point is um okay so this already i have explained so i need to i actually and yeah this siachen glacier if let's say you have a question on siachen glacier itself and why it was in news because we have we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of this mission uh, it was celebrated on april 13 and that is why this question is so important now please understand the whole siachen glacier you may have this question siachen glacier belongs to which particular range there are in, there are karakoram range zaskar range ladakh there are three ranges in that particular area so just to give you this one small information the siachen glacier is located on the eastern karakoram range the name very very important three star for it okay this is absolutely important guys and of course it's a tussle area between india and pakistan i need you to focus on this area so clearly on this map you can see this area is yours is your siachen glacier now already india and pakistan they have signed two very important agreements when it comes to demarcating the boundaries of this area 1949 karachi agreement where actually the line of control was first time it was demarcated in 72 shimla agreement again but the problem was every time we negotiated the boundary or the border or loc with pakistan it was till this point only and this point is called the nj9842 our loc ends here loc that starts from this area actually this whole this whole line that you can see this is our line of control but this line of control ends at nj9842 and neither sides they have not uh, negotiated under whose control the siachen glacier is going to be and there we got the information that pakistan is trying to take control of this position because this is a glacier absolutely no economic value but very very strategic position why very very strategic i'm i'm telling because from the siachen glacier you can actually monitor the activities of pakistan you can actually monitor the activities of china as well and that's why whosoever gets the hold of siachen glacier always going to be having some advantage when whenever any tough situation comes and that's why and pakistan already started before india pakistan tried to capture siachen glacier under operation aba aba Beel. and in response to that operation meghdoot was launched very successful and even today we are holding our positions it's a big success guys and because of the kind of tussle we have on the siachen glacier between india and pakistan that has actually made siachen glacier as the highest battlefield of the world it is the highest better battlefield of the world nowhere in the world at such height you have never you have never seen any uh, you know fight between any two armies but india had one fight at that location and here is the saltaro bridge i was talking about so this is your siachen and this is saltaro so it is clearly on the immediate west side so be careful about the areas and and i and i sincerely i'm telling you guys be do prepare the map of ladakh do prepare the map of jammu kashmir you are definitely going to see some questions coming from that particular area question number 10 on pay, uh, on your screen guys question number 10 was which of the following bodies published the paper that talks about that examines the income and wealth inequality in India from 1922 23 1922 to 2023 so in the last 100 year very interestingly last 100 years data and trends and analysis was published recently this one particular body which has published this paper the trends of the last 100 years actually talks about the income 
and wealth inequality that is there in India. So very, the important keyword is inequality. So clearly, what if even if I have to do any guesswork, so very logically, which option I'm going to choose? The word inequality lab. That is the right answer. Even for the guesswork, this is the most likely option to be guessed. No? Inequality report or inequality analysis by inequality lab. Makes some sense. There's a direct connection. So easy, straightforward, you could have attempted it. But whatever it has published is of immense importance for your exam. Not just for the prelim, but for the mains as well. So recently, this World Inequality Lab examined the last 100 years of wealth and income inequality in India. And this whole uh, research and the whole report was published based on various data from various sources, based on national income accounts, wealth aggregator, tax records, surveys, everything based on all that comprehensive analysis, this report was prepared. And you must be aware of the trends and the key findings of this report because you never know you may have a question coming on that kind of thing as well. So when you talk about this World Inequality Lab report, how it has shown the growth in average incomes, where from 1960-1990, the growth rate of the incomes in India was 1.6% per year. Between 19 and 2022, the growth rate was 3.6% per year, the way our incomes were growing. But the fastest period of income growth was somewhere between 2005 and 10 with 4.3% growth income per year and 2010 and 15 where the average income of Indians were growing at 4.9%. Look at this, this was a golden period from 2005 to 2015 that was a golden period in terms of income growth of Indians. Also this report has mentioned the emergence of the high net uh, high net worth individuals. From 90 to 2022, India actually experienced rise in national income overall. But we also have seen some few individuals really rising above the bar. We have seen some of the individuals really become super crazily rich. That was between 1990 and 2002. When I use the word very high net worth individual, actually any person, anybody who is having a wealth, net wealth, somewhere more than $1 billion, that person is going to be called as very high net worth individual. Also, we have seen the rise in the percentage of income taxpayers. Way back in 1990s, only 1% adults were paying the income tax. So definitely since income has increased and better tax compliance are done by the tax monitoring and tax compliance and rules are made by the government now, from that 1990s of only 1% people paying income tax, right now roughly 9% individuals are paying income tax somewhere between 2017 and 2020. So obviously the people's income have increased, the government mechanism of tax collection has improved, so everything has improved in such a way. But very alarming. Extreme levels of inequality we have seen in the last year, just 2022-23, there is humongous increase in terms of inequality. I mean, right now, it's a very shocking and concerning thing that top 1% population of India receives 22.6% of the national income. And this is the highest since 1922. Nothing of such thing has happened in the last 100 years, which is happening right now. And that is actually causing a lot of concern for many, many people in India and overseas. Next question number 11 talks about the Bhasha net portal. Two things. Bhasha, okay, I am talking about the language part. Net, some relation to internet. Okay, keywords. Always try to pick up the keywords. Now, I have got my keywords in my mind. Now, I can I can proceed with the question. So, clearly, okay, just, just think about it. I am talking about the internet. I am talking about the language. Why? Think logically. Of course, I understand this portal definitely going to have some connection with the Ministry of Electronics and IT because that is the nodal agency whenever it comes to the internet or IT services, right? So that makes sense. But why would I include the National Payment Corporation of India? I am not talking about any digital payments and without any payment settlement kind of thing, why would NPCI going to get included? 
so very logically i am not telling you the right answer i am telling you how to eliminate the wrong statement so very obviously this statement looks wrong because bhasha and internet has nothing to do with the payment and be careful whenever you have the statement like this only all always you know very keywords be careful if that is really the case or maybe 90% that's going to be a wrong statement if this is wrong or right i'll tell you once let me give you some information about the bhasha net portal guys so talking about this bhasha net portal it's a joint initiative of the maiti and not national payment corporation but along with that national internet exchange of india makes sense because i have to include anything of internet not of any payment kind of thing right now these two together the nixi and maiti together have launched the bhasha net portal and this was launched at universal acceptance day event but my question is what exactly this is this bhasha net portal actually support universal acceptance by offering resources and tools in all indian languages what i am trying to do i am going to remove the language barriers because right now majorly the information available on the internet is in english language very and somehow some information is some only few indian languages right now very interestingly the portal has this one clarity that all the resources on the net must be available in 22 indian languages as per the schedule 8 so we have our schedule 8 no and 8 22 languages are scheduled language so at least for wider accessibility of the internet content the the resources must be available in all 22 scheduled languages of india right so that anybody and everybody can access there would be less digital divide and everyone has access to digital services in their own languages and considering that fact i can actually eliminate the option number 3 here so of course uh, this bhasha net portal is not going to have resources only in 10 languages that make no sense I mean I was very much convinced that this this has no sense because if I'm going to create a portal why only 10 at least there would be 22 languages in all indian scheduled languages no not all indian language but all scheduled languages at least so clearly my first and third are wrong with my common sense and second second as the name says very very interestingly bhasha net portal is going to support universal acceptance offering resource tool is quite relatable to the portal so even if i have not read this concept i could have still solved this question very easily with the right answer is only one here two is the right answer this question was a easy one no sir it was a medium level but could have been attempted with the common sense i hope that is clear to everyone and do remember the small small facts that we just have discussed guys that brings us to the question number 12 the question number 12 talks about the soil the school soil health program now already there is a soil health program it's not a new concept you know what a soil health program is where we are going and checking the samples of the of the soil based on and then uh, we are going to send the soil sample to the testing lab based on the lab test we are going to understand that this particular soil has this much nutrients what kind of nutrients we need to add on and based on the health of the soil the nutrition of the soil the fertility of the soil i am going to select my crops very simple soil health card is one such scheme that you must have heard based on under this soil soil health program only we always issue the soil health cards but here is one twist it's not just a soil health program the the program is school soil health program so here the keyword is not just the soil health but the school soil health that you have to keep in your head okay now let's talk about it and very careful in in this is uh, this says which statement are not correct that you need to figure out right okay so please remember i am talking about the school soil health so here this initiative is is undertaken by department of agriculture and farmer because i am going to connect these two with the term key term called soil and in collaboration with department of school education literacy because i have another key term as school school soil health that makes sense with the two keywords which possible which possible departments and ministries are going to be a part of it under this this is a pilot project we have not started it on a pan india level this pilot project 
established 20 soil lab in the Kendriya Vidalyas and the Navodya Vidalyas in the rural areas. The program has been scaled up to 1000 schools where it includes majorly what kind of schools are included? The Kendriya Vidalyas, Navodya Vidalyas and the latest Eklavya model schools all are included. Now this may be asked as an MCQ as well if you may have a, this question in your upcoming exam, right? Now very interestingly since I am talking something about agriculture it is quite possible NABAD is going to come to support me. National Bank for Agriculture Rural Development and here both things are happening because this, these soil health is about the schools, the, the agricultural uh, soil is we are talking about and we are talking about the rural areas. So very logically NABAD will facilitate the establishment of these soil labs in the school. So all these soil labs are to be set up by NABARD. NABARD is our partner in this initiative. What, what we are going to do? Simply we are going to involve the students. Students will collect the soil samples, they are going to conduct the test and based on the test results the students are going to generate the soil health cards. And then after generating the card the students are have this uh, responsibility that the students have to educate the farmers about the recommendations. So, sir, this is the quality of your soil, this has to be your crop, appropriate crop for this kind of soil. So we are including the students and I am really really happy for that because we are actually generating lot of value, lot of understanding in the students head with respect to soil, with respect to agriculture and probably it is one of the very very important initiatives that we are seeing. So clearly Niti Aayog has no place in that, second statement is correct, the third is also correct, Dabad is involved. How many statements not correct guys? Only one is not correct. Logically makes sense but of course this was again not that easy question. I am not going to put it in a easy category. It was a tough question because uh, it, it, was a, it was a pure fact, fact based question. So definitely you really have to be careful. You can solve this question like the way I have explained how you are, you, are, you are supposed to think about it. Then you can at least take a risk in this kind of question. Rather completely skipping it at least you could have attempted it the way I have explained. That brings us to the question number 13 sir. Question number 13 is adopt a heritage 2.0 program. Now what is this adopt a heritage? Very interesting question. How many statements are correct you need to figure out. Now talking about the archaeology, uh, talking about the adopt a heritage program. First thing is first that as the name says 2.0 means there, there must be some predecessor of the scheme. So adopt a heritage 2.0 is actually a revamped version of the earlier scheme called simply adopt a heritage scheme. We have launched that the first one in 2017 and that was launched under the uh, AMASR site act. AMASR means uh, the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act. So adopt a heritage original one was under this particular act. Now we have got another version of that called 2.0. So this 2.0 version has envisioned by the Archaeological Survey of India and also by understanding the act you can easily understand why Archaeological Survey of India is included. Under this adopt a heritage 2.0 program we are talking we are going to do what? We are going to preserve and promote India's cultural heritage. The idea is simple, we have to preserve and promote India's heritage in adopt a heritage 2.0 program. But how we are going to do it? This can be done by giving collective responsibility on both public and private entities in safeguarding India's cultural heritage for future generations. The program encourages even the corporate stakeholders because we know that the 2% of the profit they have to they have to spend on the corporate social responsibilities. So now even the corporates are told that you can use your corporate social responsibility 2% spending that you that is mandatory. You can also spend on this particular initiative. So rather than simply uh, spending on the on construction of the houses of economic weaker section or education or something like that even the CSR funds are going to be utilized for this particular purpose. And the selected agencies that we are selected under the adopt a heritage program, the agencies named called SMARAK uh, or the SARTHI or SATHI, 
they are going to be responsible for providing maintaining the amenities in terms of hygiene accessibility safety etc the term of the appointment will be for a period of 5 years initially which may further be extended to 5 years but originally all the appointments under the program to be done for 5 years only if you look at the statement without much trouble you can see all the three statements are correct in this category as the name says heritage we are talking about the heritage that makes us very well understand why archaeological survey of india should be there so that makes first statement right with the common sense also of course this was a tricky are we included are we including private or public both or something like that so now given the trend uh, you must have read so many programs so many government schemes and and you know the general mood of the government as well so these days obviously at many many schemes you are seeing private entities being a part so even you have to take a guess go for a positive guess in this case yes definitely the third statement may give you trouble that the name of this uh, agency is correct or not and of course if the appointment is for 5 year 10 year you, you never know so yes but the only problem the only thing is with statement number 3 where you have to uh, think uh, you know from the common sense from the from the gut feeling that you are getting but at least first two statements could have been easily guessed even in case you are not aware of the statement so it was a medium level question you could take a risk because out of three two can be easily guessed here the right answer is all three that is the right answer okay sure now that brings us to the question number 14 sir the question is very simple very straightforward question it is about pradhan mantri bhartiya jan oshadi pari yojana how many statements are not correct now this is the thing you have to be very careful about we know about pradhan mantri jan oshadi pari yojana it was launched by department of pharmaceuticals because i'm talking about jan oshadi no oshadi is medicine so medicine we know the medicines which ministries are responsible for medicine department of pharmaceutical ministry of chemical fertilizer very common sense and the outlets under the pradhan mantri jan oshadi yojana so this yojana was actually launched to provide generic medicines at affordable prices to the Indian customer, Indian people. Generic medicines are the copies of branded medicines. I told you many times earlier also. So, uh, to provide the medicines at affordable levels, the government gives a compulsory license to the local domestic pharmaceutical companies. They can copy exact the same copy of the of that branded medicines, but of course not for profit making, but to keep the price very low to actually make accessible the make the medicine accessible to the to, uh, and affordable to the people and for that purpose for providing those generic medicine the some shops were to be open under pradhan mantri bharti janoshadi pari yojana and the shops are known as jan oshadi kendra they are the that, that is the name of the shop that is, uh, that is going to distribute the generic medicine so both statements are absolutely correct not correct means answer has to be neither one nor two because both are correct very easy very straightforward not at all problematic and very important scheme as well right and it was in news for many many reasons so be careful about the question question number 15 now this question is again very very important guys the question is about unnati 2024 now the problem is if you know the full form of the word unnati your question can be solved if you don't know the meaning and full form of unnati then you really have a narrow scope of guesswork why i'll explain so first let's understand if the full form helps us or not the word unnati the scheme unnati means uttar purv northeast uttar purv transformative industrialization scheme so i have got two important keywords here one that i'm talking about industrialization transformation of industries in the northeastern region of india so unnati scheme has a direct connection to the northeastern states where we are going to make them more and more industrialized okay now this government of india has formulated this is a new industrial development scheme for northeast india as the name says unnati now since i'm talking about industrialization very logically which ministry i should be looking at for industrialization I am going to go for Ministry of Commerce and Industry. 
and under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, there is a dedicated department called the DPIIT, the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade and it proposes a 10 year term under the Unnati program. So very logical and as the name says and, and please be careful which statement is central sector scheme, which statement is central sponsored scheme that is very important. So this is a central sector scheme that we are looking at means 100% funding to be done by central government. This Unnati central sector scheme the objective as the name says very clear to foster the economic growth and industrialization in the northeast region of India. All eligible industrial units are to commence their production within the four years from the grant of registration and under the Unnati scheme the entire districts are categorized into two zones where zone A is going to be industrial advanced district where zone B is going to be industrial backward district. So we are going to distinguish very clearly so that we can focus properly on the backward districts and make them more and more industrialized. And under the scheme there is a maximum eligible benefit is 250 crore rupees per unit that is the maximum limit where 60 percent fund allocation to be done uh, uh, of the part A to be done uh, for 8 northeastern states 40 percent on the first in post out basis okay and very important uh, fact GST not applicable for investments up to 10 crore rupees. If anybody wants to invest in the northeastern industrialization program up to 10 crore rupees no GST would be charged. So that so we are encouraging more and more investments coming into that. So now if you know the two things very clearly now you can know the answer both statements are correct. Only problem was to know the full form of the scheme. So every time I say whenever you are reading any government scheme these days do focus and read the full forms try to memorize the full form sometimes the full form actually makes the things very simple to guess and you can do a logical guesswork in that particular kind of cases. So both statements are correct question was a medium level not very tough not very easy but could have been attempted or at least could have been risked if you know something about this particular question otherwise it was a straightforward for many people it was an easy to attempt kind of question. Next question number 16 this question is about the foundational literacy and numeracy assessment test called FLNAT very very heavy name foundational literacy numeracy assessment but the name itself says a lot. So what this test is all about we are going to check the foundational literacy and numeracy the, the knowledge of language and the knowledge of mathematics in the students. The name says it all foundational literacy numeracy assessment test. How many statements are correct we have to figure out based on the three statements. So first of all at least we are aware what we what we are looking at. So this so called foundational literacy numeracy assessment test the government of India conduct this particular test under the Ullas scheme Ullas Nav Bharat Saksharta Karyakram where we really want to increase the literacy and numeracy level and understanding in the children of our schools. So this whole foundation literacy numeracy test it is conducted by department of school education and literacy under ministry of education obviously which ministry because we are talking about their literacy numeracy so the two name itself says it has to be ministry of education without any doubt but please understand here is a trick this particular initiative the this test initiative which is checking and assessing literacy numeracy skills is not applicable for all states of India because there are already some states which are doing wonderful for example states like Kerala. So basically what which states we are focusing upon which are not doing well in terms of literacy numeracy skills and that is why only 23 states of India are right now covered under this foundational literacy numeracy test and how we are going to evaluate the skills of the students based on three subjects how good you are at reading how good you are in writing and how good you are in mathematics numeracy there is going to be 50 mark test for each subject and based on that we are going to assess which state is performing in what particular way 
and all the tests they are conducted in the learner's regional language so that so that there should not be any discrepancy so all the tests under the uh, the uh, foundation uh, literacy numeracy are going to be in the regional language of the student we are actually focusing on promoting multilingualism that is the that is the whole idea guys already in 2023 two such tests were conducted way back in march and september where more than 36 lakh learners were certified by this particular test that they yes they have they are good with foundation literacy and numeracy right we just have mentioned about the ullas scheme because the whole test was conducted under the ullas nav bharat sakshatra karyakram so what is ullas even the full form of ullas is important the full form of ullas stands for understanding lifelong learning for all in society and this particular scheme talks about that how you can reach every individual and address the gap wherever there is a gap in basic literacy and critical life skills they are going to be taught to the individual under the ullas scheme previously the name of ullas was new india literacy program but then it was revamped and renamed as ullas it's a central sponsored scheme with objective to impart the basic education digital education financial literacy and critical skills to all the individuals 15 year plus it's a criteria the person has to be 15 or more than 15 then the ulla scheme comes into the play at the priority is always given to girls women sc st obc minorities and divyangs that is the whole idea behind it guys now the only thing which is not correct and i and i understand which is actually many people may have missed first statement is very easy to guess because talking literacy and numeracy obviously ministry of education the only problem that you must have faced by by this statement was that this test is conducted across all states of india i know it was not easy to guess but again i am telling you words like all only always never very extreme words always try to rethink about these kind of words so this is incorrect third is correct so yes the question i would say it was a it was a medium level question you could have taken a risk but th this one problem always going to be very important you really have to eliminate and be careful with such statements right so how many statements are correct sir only two are statement are correct but of course first and third are easy to guess all also right question number 17 talks about critical crime management system okay let's assume that you have not read about it at all read the read the keyword two three times you are supposed to find out which statement best describe the so called primary function what could be think about it what could be the primary function of a system called as criminal crime management system think about it do you think do you think this criminal crime management system is going to be about providing legal representation doesn't make much sense to us do you think it is about the platform between legal representative prosecutors discussing cases in privately not make much sense to me either right so sometimes you know don't know the answer when you read the statements you have this automatically this gut feeling that probably this this doesn't seem okay this doesn't seem very convincingly the function of something called as criminal crime management system so simply i would have eliminated the two and simply eliminated the third also criminal crime management system doesn't seem to be any fee based system providing electronic records in california no what exactly criminal crime management system the best possible even the options are so silly that you could have eliminated all the three with only one obvious choice left that is this is a platform intended to streamline management of criminal cases very convincingly you can connect with the word where we are focusing on terrorism and organized crime so so we really want to streamline because once you streamline the nature of the criminal cases which are terrorism related cases which are organized related crimes so so by streamlining you can always manage the better manage the things better okay with only common sense this question was not easy it it was a tough question but you could have attempted very well with a common sense and elimination you could have solved this question so answer has to be b that is there and it has nothing to do with california it is it is india system guys recently our home minister 
has launched the digital criminal case management uh, system platform and this is a system platform relating to national investigation agency the NIA of India and it's a browser based software where we really want to enhance the coordination in terms of terrorism and organized crimes all such cases handled by NIA that is important and the major features of this cr criminal case management system where we really want to improve justice delivery by how by streamlining investigations and prosecutions very user friendly it also state uh, it is also uh, a support for the state police it is also good for data integration because you have the whole portal where you, the whole software where you can easily segregate the things right that is important guys that brings us to the next question the next question is the eat right campus that is the next question which statement is not correct now very importantly sometimes we know the answer but we fail to see which is correct or not correct kind of thing so always be careful i am that's why i am highlighting this again and again so talking about the eat right campus what i need to know about it let's try to focus on that so first thing is first when I, when i am talking about the scheme the eat right campus initiative this one particular initiative is led by the fssi food safety standard authority of india and fssai has recently certified nearly 100 prisons across the country as eat right campuses the 100 prisons are given the tag of eat right campus how do we give that tag i mean how do we evaluate which particular campus is eat right campus or not basically the campus is given rating on a five star scale and any campus having score of three or more star is actually certified as a eat right campus but the certification is valid for only two years remember that okay two things are important also as the name says eat right campus what could be the objective the objective is simple to improve the health of the people and the planet promote social economic development of the nation though it is not mandatory to adopt it's not like every institution every campus every organization they have to adopt it it's not mandatory it's voluntary but again if you do that it definitely provide immense benefits to the campus and individuals because because you are actually eating the right things and it's it's more like awareness campaign understood where it aims to provide safe healthy and sustainable food in campuses like school university colleges workplace hospitals prisons like that right and that is that is why the whole idea now if you look at the question the question is having some issues why first thing is first eat right campus we just have understood it associates with the fssai not the bis so clearly this is wrong the association is with fssai also very logically you can think if i'm talking about safe healthy and sustainable food this is a key word so automatically the first thing that should come to your mind when you talk about think about safe healthy food it has to be fssai it talks about the food safety and standard authority of india so it doesn't and bis is not for this particular kind of thing it it is a quality me measurement but not for the for the food kind of thing with with respect to food it has to be fssai so first is not correct and even third is not correct because we just have learned so any campus having not two or more but three or more star they are going to be called as certified as eat right campus second being correct so question it was a it was an easy question very straightforward question could have been attempted without trouble how many statement not correct sir the two statements are not correct only one are correct brings us to the question number 19 now this question again very interesting question the question is with reference to ethanol 100 which statement is correct with respect to ethanol 100 you need to learn but obviously you know about ethanol it's a biofuel we are talking about no it's a biofuel ethanol is one one of the biofuels that that is very popular these days so obviously if you just keep the keep in mind the word biofuel you can solve the question easily ethanol 100 forget about the 100 100 is just to confuse you ethanol biofuel keep this in mind why are we using biofuels these days biofuels are promoted as a clean green source no 
as a clean green source. So biofuel, ethanol it is. So obviously it, it is going to be a cleaner and a greener alternative to the normal gasoline, petrol, diesel that we use. And it is obviously going to have a high octane rating for high efficiency. So very logically, even without getting into detail of ethanol 100, if I simply keep in mind the word biofuel, I can solve this question. Obviously, this kind of biofuel enhances efficiency. Obviously, it is going to enhance the power output while minimizing the environmental impact, very obvious. So very easy question could have been attempted without even much knowledge, a basic understanding of biofuels. You could solve this question as answer C, both 1 and 2 is the right answer. So some questions are meant to be, you know, it, they are meant to seem difficult, but they are not difficult in real terms. But now, because I am discussing it, so you need to know some basic facts also. Ethanol 100 recently launched by the Petroleum Minister. It is a clean green alternative to gasoline. It has, obviously it is a biofuel, so it obviously going to emit lower level of greenhouse gases, less number of pollutants which is very good and that is why it is so much preferable in our fight against climate change. If you really want to improve the air quality, you really have to focus on that. And it has a high octane rating with the rating of near between 100 to 105, making it very suitable for high performance engines. Ethanol 100 enhances efficiency power output while minimizing the environmental impact and that is why it is going to be used, it is very very obvious going to be used in, in the flex fuel vehicles where they, such flex fuel vehicles are those kind of vehicles, they can run on multiple fuels, gasoline, ethanol or even the blend of the two. So very soon it is, it is going to become a mainstream fuel option in future and that is why we are focusing on that. Okay? Brings us to the last question guys, question 20 that talks about the PM Suraj portal. Now, why I should be learning about this? PM Suraj portal, first of all, again the same thing, the full form is going to solve the whole purpose. What is PM Suraj portal and what I need to know about it? Simply by decoding the full form, the PM Suraj stands for Pradhan Mantri Samajik Uthan, Social Upliftment. Pradhan Mantri, Samajik Uthan, Social Upliftment and Rozgar Adharit Jan Kalyan, the Employment Based Social Welfare. Employment Based Social Welfare. I think the name says everything. So now you know if there is any portal talking about social upliftment, talking about employment based social welfare. So which ministry? Ministry of Employ uh, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, very obvious. And whom, whom we really want to uplift in society? Obviously the marginalized sections. So the, the portal is very obviously telling that I am going to focus on uplifting the marginalized segments like the SC population, ST population, the backward classes, the sanitation workers by providing them credit assistance, by giving them some uh, loan kind of services. The credit support will be provided to eligible person across the country and that credit is to be given via the portal by through the banks, NBFCs or the multi financial institutions or some kind of organizations. So the whole purpose is social upliftment but how? I am going to uplift by giving the, social, the marginalized people, I am going to assist them with the credit. So the portal has this one important function of connecting the bank and the eligible beneficiary. That portal is going to connect the PM Suraj portal. So now if you look at the question, now you, you know all the facts about it. The right answer is supposed to be, which statement is incorrect, okay? So very important, which statement, is, select the incorrect statement, uh, incorrect from this, right? Okay, so now there is a confusion. Actually, above it is written which statements are correct and then it says which are incorrect. So I think this has to be same. It has to be correct, not the incorrect one, it has to be the same one. So yes, the both statements are correct, answer has to be C. If I take correct into consideration, if the question says incorrect, then of, of course it is going to be the second one. So this particular question, it was an easy one, straightforward, without any trouble. All you need was, all was needed to decode the Suraj portal and you could have attempted this question without any trouble. 
So that is all from my side guys in the, in the video number one. This is your part number one. I really hope you have enjoyed. If you did, then give us a thumbs up, like the video, share the video and do tell your feedback in the comment section below how, how important this video for you and how it has enhanced your knowledge. I really hope you have enjoyed and you are enjoying the, uh, all the video discussions. See you guys in the part number two very, very soon. All my best wishes for the upcoming exam. Jain.